So you tweeted this out. So China effectively committed a war crime against its own people and then the rest of the world. Now it's attacking anyone who claims it mishandled the virus. It's time to start thinking the PRC leadership seriously as the most dangerous regime on the planet. Now, right now, you know, there's a big neocon push for, for hostilities with China. They, they pivoted off of hostilities with Russia to China. And there actually is a pivot militarily. So don't you think that that's dangerous to do that? Like, aren't you kind of saber rattling as a, in a neocon way? What do you say to that? Yeah, so it's a much longer conversation. Um, what I would say is, is so in, in Goliath, right, in my book, there is a chapter called Trust Busters Against Hitler. And one of the things to understand, so the Russia, Russia's mad at us because we destroyed the country in the 1990s. Um, that's Larry Summers' fault. Like, we we looted them uh, and helped establish an oligarchy. Right. And it was catastrophic. And, and it's our fault. And then, you know, Putin's a bad guy, but, like, Russia has legit grievances against us. Right. They've done bad things to us, but it's not like they don't really care. They're not like natural enemy, right? They don't care about the U.S. Basically, they just want to be respected on the world stage. So that's that's the neocons, like you know, trying to bring Ukraine into NATO and all that crazy lunatic yep. stuff. You know, it's bullshit. Um, uh, China, though, is different, and um, uh, China is like the Nazi regime. They are uh, um, they are Han supremacists, and I know this can sound very weird, okay? Because it's like it's not in our language, so I understand that. But they are um, they are they believe in uh, ethnic supremacy for the Han people, and they are an expansionist, uh, authoritarian slash totalitarian regime that is systematically trying to make sure that everybody in the world becomes effectively a Chinese vassal. Um, they are exporting their. They're doing all sorts of things on the diplomatic level, on the economic level, on the political level, um, including lying about the virus. They're telling everyone in the world uh, the U.S. military engineered the virus and uh, and 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 spread it around the world. Um, and uh, and they're they're manipulating our own corporations. I know you saw the censorship of the NBA. I know you've seen censorship of Disney. Like they're censoring us. Like we make. Um, uh, like our corporations make choices according to the whims of Chinese censors. And I'm sorry, but I don't think it's appropriate for Chinese censors to be censoring Americans in America. So they're doing all of these things that are really dangerous. They're also intertwining their supply chains with us and cherry picking strategic assets, which is very similar to what Hitler was doing to the allies. And we had to use our antitrust laws to, to prevent that. Um, I, the chapter in my book, Trust Pressures Against Hitler, goes over that. But just to give you, um, a, uh, there's a quote from an antitrust lawyer who said, the difference between uh, bombing a munition factory uh, or bombing an aluminum factory and just arranging a through corporate law that it never gets built in the first place is largely a, a difference in the amount of noise involved. Now, the thing to understand is China doesn't want a war and we don't want a war. China wants to subdue us without a war. So what they want is they want to be able to make the things that we need, like medicine, for example, which they make a lot of it now, and they want to be able to cut us off at will and subdue us and force us to do what they want. Now, this, the right strategy to deal with China is not to go to war, right? And I don't think that, um, I don't think that, that the, the neocons are crazy and a lot of them should be in jail. But the right strategy should be to, and they also are responsible for a lot of our problems with China because they ended up supporting a lot of the trade deals that pushed a lot of our productive capacity to China. The right strategy is to start um, re rebuilding, first of all, rebuilding liberal democracy here because we have to fight an ideological conflict with China. China is making the argument a totalitarian system with this surveillance technology that we're exporting is better and you should, you know, Nigeria and various other places, they're exporting it. And the Americans, they don't have anything to offer you. And the thing is, is right now they're right because we are not a liberal democracy and Donald Trump doesn't believe in liberal democracy. And so the, the right strategy to address China is not to make racist comments about the Chinese, which is sort of what, what Trump is doing. While he is also blaming the Chinese legitimately for their propaganda, there's an ambiguity there, which is a problem. The right strategy is to recommit ourselves to liberal democracy here and then try to bring back some of our supply chains and build a society that is actually appealing. 
and that can deliver things that people in the rest of the world need and that people in the rest of the world want to emulate. That's how we protect ourselves from what is really a dangerous Chinese threat. It's a very different strategy than what the neocons are talking about. It's not a military first strategy. A military conflict with China would be catastrophic. But we do have to recognize that China, the Chinese government has a lot of power. They have a lot of agency. They mean us ill. Uh, and it's very dangerous. But we have to well, there's a lot of things we have to do domestically to address that. And, and by taking on, by recommitting ourselves to liberal democracy, what I, what I also mean is, is destroying the power of Wall Street. Because China is able to manipulate America through their control of Wall Street. Because Wall Street is just greedy. They don't care about our own national security. They'll just take Chinese money and sell China anything they want, including vital assets. And now we're dependent on China for a whole bunch of stuff because Wall Street sold us out. So recommitting ourselves, a real strategy against China means recommitting ourselves to liberal democracy, uh, self-government, and destroying the power of Wall Street. And I think the foreign policy community and the military, which has traditionally not been on the side of, of people who are populist or, or progressive, whatever you want to call it, I do think they're moving in that direction. And the thing is, is if, if the... Um, if people who have kind of sympathy for, I don't want to call myself a left winger because I don't know what that means anymore. But if you really are somebody who believes in liberal democracy, then this is a really good organizing model to say, look, part of what's happening in the world at large is that America has lost its ability to be an appealing state to emulate. And we need to get that back. And I think that that's a very powerful message, a very powerful argument. It's hard to make it in the Trump era when, you know, Trump has just said any basically made it so that any criticism of China is racist. But that's that's what I'm trying to say. OK. Um, you know, Jack Ma, who's the head of Alibaba, which is the Amazon of Asia, said that people get mad at China for this system. He said, but this isn't China's idea. This was the United States businessmen's idea to outsource all their jobs to China and uh, and then, you know, hollow out our manufacturing base here in the United States. That was our doing. We even gave tax credits for them to do that stuff. And so people getting angry at China, this we really did this to ourselves. Right? Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that's right. And um, uh, like we empowered the Chinese authoritarian state because Wall Street wanted to destroy the power of labor here. Right. And that's 100 percent right. And I, I think that's that's what that's the reason the xenophobic nativist message of Trump is wrong, because it's also actually our own fault. But that means it's you know, it's it's Bill Clinton's fault. It's Obama's fault. It's Bush's fault. And now it's Trump's fault because they're not actually cracking down on on Wall Street that was doing a lot of this. Right. So I 100 percent agree with that. Um, at the same time, the fact that we empower China doesn't mean that China is a good actor. It, like just because we armed a bat, like gr a group of people that mean us ill, and we recognize that we did that, doesn't mean that they don't mean us ill. They do, and so we have to recognize that. We have to recognize that they are using their diplomatic and and propaganda apparatus to lie about the um, the coronavirus, right? We didn't do that. They're doing that. So, and then they, they, they do they they break the arms of our corporations all the time. They hack and steal um, our our knowledge base. They do bribery. They they do a lot of things to us that are dangerous. But what what Jack Ma was saying, and I think what a lot of Chinese um, business people say is, look, you didn't want to make this thing in America because it was cheaper to make it in China. And let's be honest about that. And I think that that's right. I think that's correct. We have to recognize that 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 China's position in power is in many ways a result of of uh, of, Wall, of the choices of Wall Street, Bill Clinton, George Bush, um, and Barack Obama. And I think that we should recognize that, uh, and 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 we should come to terms with it. But we also have to recognize that China is a bad actor. Okay. Yeah, you know, I know, you know, so this seems, you could see how that would seem as inflammatory to some people as what Donald Trump says, right? Well, of course, but that's, but like, the, what, what China did with the virus was, was catastrophic. I mean, what, they, what? they, they absolutely lied about it. Um, 
in the beginning, and, and then they manipulated the World Health Organization into lying about it. So Taiwanese doctors were saying in November, because they were working with Chinese doctors, um, this is a contagious disease. It, is, it goes from human to human. And they were telling the WHO that that best was the case. And the WHO was ignoring them because of Chinese diplomatic muscle. Taiwan is not a member of the WHO. And the WHO has been doing whatever China wants because everyone's afraid of China. So the WHO lies about the nature of the disease for a month or two at the pivotal moment really? when it really could have addressed it. At the same, you know, China also lied to its own people and caused a lot of death and destruction in their own country. And then because they didn't handle it right initially, we now have a global pandemic. Now, they're not responsible for how we've handled it. They're not responsible for how Europe has handled it, but they are responsible for how they handled it. And they are responsible for corrupting the World Health Organization and um, and making uh, the, the rest of the world less capable of actually addressing the problem. Now, I don't think that we would have handled it better if the World Health Organization had warned us earlier, but I think other countries might have, and that is on China. Okay. I Okay, that's great information. All right, Matt Stoller, the uh, the author of Goliath, the hundred year war between monopoly power and democracy. Uh, thanks for taking time out and talking with us, and I hope to have you back on soon. Anything hey, you want to anything you want to leave us with that I forgot to ask you? Yeah, I want to leave us with some hope because I think that's important. Like what I show in Goliath is that we have been in situations like this before that seem hopeless, that seem awful. And we have regained our liberties. And it really is up to us. Um, so we can do it. I mean, it's not impossible. And it and it and it's fun. That's the thing, is fighting for righteousness is fun and like joyful. And like we we can do that. I mean, it, it's like this is great stuff. This is a great country. I mean, we are we have the honor of living in a democracy. We really do. And even though we make bad decisions, that's not inevitable. Um, so that's kind of what I'd, what I'd leave you with. Yeah, but it's going to be really hard to do anything right now because we can't organize, right? Because we can't get in the streets and we can't go out and meet people. We can't congregate. And it's almost like the perfect storm for fascism because, uh, you know, we can't go out and congregate or, or work together or organize. And if we do, we're breaking some kind of a law, right? You know, look, I um, we're not in a fascist state. Uh, fascism is very different than the state that we would be in. We could go fascist, but we're not fascist. Um, and look, when when Benjamin Franklin said, you know, what do you got at the Constitution? You, know, you got a republic if you can keep it. You know, it, it, that that's not like a lot of people like to toss that around. But like we've established a, a kind of fascist state in Jim Crow South. Um, we had slavery that, which was, which was a, a fascist system. Like, can it happen here? It has happened here. Uh, and it, it could happen here again, but you know, we, we responded to a really serious financial crisis in the 1890s by establishing Jim Crow. And we established to a really serious financial crisis in the, in the late 1920s, and early thirties by doing the new deal. Like we can do this differently. We don't have to go down a very dark road, right? We don't have to. That's not inevitable. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that last bit of optimism, Matthew Stoller. I appreciate you taking time. Everybody check out Goliath. Thanks a lot. Hey, this is the part where I tell you where our live shows are, but there aren't any. <laughs> and then I would tell you to go join our premium, but, but nobody has a fucking job. So why don't you just enjoy the video?